read from one section, but before I do so, I want to kind of get you on the move because something I'm going to talk about in the reading uh, is pertinent. So, can everyone sing this note? Uh, uh, so repeat after me. This is a basic principle from linguistics called the arbitrariness of the sign. There's nothing about the symbolic usage of language or culture that requires this to be called book or kitab. That's the principle of the arbitrariness of the sign. So I'm going to read from you a section called the arbitrariness of the scale. Intonation and musical scales are cultural products, not mathematical objects. I'm going to read that sentence again because this is the most important sentence I've written in my entire life. <laughs> Intonation and musical scales are cultural products, not mathematical objects. That makes them easy to comprehend on a practical level, but challenging on a theoretical level. On a practical level, we have personally found that even American children with no prior hearing of Arabic music can sing maqam scales in tune immediately when asked to imitate basic melodies in a call and response fashion, central technique of oral transmission. And you guys did as well as the kids in the talk. <laughs> At the same time, on a theoretical level, we have encountered so many misconceptions, misunderstandings, and misrepresentations stemming from both Western and Arabic sources, that we find it necessary to examine and critique some of the underlying assumptions about scales and intonation before proceeding with a description of the system in use. The most problematic assumption we wish to dispel is the idea that intonation and scales are determined by some kind of mathematical logic. We understand the roots of this misconception. The ancient Egyptian discovery of rational harmonic relationships based on small interval ratios among strings of different lengths resulting in consonant sounds, which Pythagoras learned on his travels to Egypt and developed into a rich tetrachord theory, influencing all subsequent music theory in the Arab world and Europe. The harmonic relationships are indeed very real and based on physical reality. Sound waves produce upper harmonics in integral multiples of their base frequencies, and the act of blending two sound waves whose frequencies relate to each other in simple interval ratios, such as 3 to 2, 4 to 3, 5 to 4, results in combined sounds that are simple and periodic and which many perceive as pleasing. I'm going to show you what that means very quickly. So physically speaking, acoustically, these two notes are in the ratio of three to two. And you can hear that there's a consonance that arises because I can play it out of tune. And you can hear when it goes in tune. So that consonance is based on physical reality. However, to pick up in the book, 
However, this phenomenon obscures the fact that the, it was nonetheless a cultural choice to utilize such intervals and scales, and even a choice to blend two different pitches together in the first place. The ideas of consonance and harmonious or pleasing sounds are dependent on cultural factors based on the preferences of human beings and shared and transmitted in various ways. Cultures around the world use different musical scales that are not based on such ratios, yet make music that is acceptable and pleasing to them. Arabic scales have many intervals that cannot be described using simple harmonic ratios, and observation <coughs> shows they have varied over historical time and geographic region. These tiny differences in interval sizes are perceptible to the ear, enough so that they can be used to identify the region and time period of the practitioner. So we can tell an Egyptian musician from a Syrian musician. And just like accents and dialects, such differences in musical intonation can be learned perfectly by anyone through oral transmission. It is on the basis of this reality that we assert that musical intervals and scales are fundamentally arbitrary, following Saussure's definition of the arbitrariness of the sign, by which we mean that they are the result of cultural choices and conventions, even in cases where there are mathematical relationships expressed in some of them. Arbitrary in this technical sense is very different from the colloquial understanding of the term, which people take to mean random, unjustified, or capricious. Instead, for us, it means based on choices. In Johnny's reading, he highlighted the fact that modulation is based on choice. Choices which are then shared by communities and passed down. Our understanding of Arabic intervals and scales shares one more feature with Saussure's concept of the arbitrariness of the sign. These musical elements do not appear arbitrary to practitioners immersed in their usage. Instead, they appear to be immutable, determined, and part of fundamental truth. That is because the individual practitioner inherits them through tradition and cannot individually change them. Just like when you're speaking, you can't decide I'm going to speak any words I want. They only change extremely gradually over time and only by the unconscious activity of whole communities. It is only with a comparative approach, approach as in linguistics, that their arbitrariness becomes apparent. We can state our objection to the underlying assumptions common in both Western and Arab music theory in another way. We do not find that there are rules governing music, but habits. The elements of music must be learned individually. They cannot be derived from other elements of music. Therefore, the function of music theory, from our perspective, is not to create rules that explain music. It amazes us that in the other arts, people fully recognize that one must learn each dance step, or each cooking technique, or each brush stroke, while in music, so many people falsely assume that one can derive scales from mathematical principles and melodies from rules. 